Okay, so what I thought I'd do today is um, try to focus on a psychological understanding of body dysmorphic disorder, something we've been sort of trying to understand over the past 30 years, um, and really try and talk to individuals with BDD and their carers, and um, think about some of the clinical implications of, about what the sort of things we've been finding. I think it's fair to say uh, my influences as well. It was 1991, I think, I was newly appointed as a consultant, and um, at that time, BDD was still very rare, and there were some standard treatments of things of exposure, just test things uh, of things of that way. And I had a male patient with BDD who was um, married with a small child, and he was very preoccupied with the size of his wrists. It's a rather less common uh, presentation, but the day after admission, he, he committed suicide on the underground near our hospital. And I think that must have had a very profound effect on me in terms of thinking, we don't really know much about this, and how could I have missed this, and this, that, and the other. So that, um, that's, I guess, when we first started to think about BED. Um, so the first the thing that I've been focusing mainly on is the idea of self as an aesthetic object. And you can represent that pictorially there um, by the, sort of the idea of self as a walking nose, where you're very self-conscious, it feels like the spotlight is on you, and that people are looking at you. And we wrote about that um, first in, a, in a, the first little early controlled trial, where you can see actually Rob's name as well down there when he was a student <laughs> at, <laughs> at our hospital. Uh, that was in, 19, uh, sorry, in uh, 1996. So what I wanted to try and do first of all is try and unpack this concept of um, self as an aesthetic object. What is it? Because it's a rather grand name. So I'm going to go through each of these things in turn. The first is the, the idea of the body image, that there is, as you will see, there's an exaggeration of the features that people perceive to be defective. And the feature tends to define the self or the identity of the individual. Um, we'll be talking about how there's a sense of fusion, that because one has this image, it is the truth. There's also a lot of what we call self-focused attention, the way you look back at yourself in your own mind. You're evaluating yourself as ugly and defective, and you expect to be rejected or humiliated. And the emotions, the dominant emotions, are shame, self-disgust, and anxiety. And it's often linked with past aversive experiences. And you'll find that some of these concepts overlap, but they're all different ways of thinking about these things in psychological terms. So the first thing I'm saying is that BD is a body image problem. And that what we first found that was that many people with BD experience an image or what we best describe as a felt impression of the way they feel about their feature. And remember the term imagery is not just a, uh, a visual thing, like a picture in your mind, but it can be a physical sensation or a smell and so on. And that was a small study we did back in 2004 where we compared people with BDD and people without BDD. And it's interesting that both BDD people and the controls both experienced image about how they felt they looked, um, but the BDD patients rated their image much more vividly. They were more recurrent in terms of their, their images, more uh, distorted in terms of one or more features were appearing much bigger. And it was much more likely to be viewed from an observer perspective. And by that, individuals were describing how they're looking back at themselves. And these images were associated with early memories, particularly about being te teased, bullied, uh, changes in adolescence, occasionally sexual abuse. Um, and so obviously the aim in therapy is to put these memories in the past so they no longer have that sense of nowness. And we started to think a little bit more about how can individuals with BDD try to convey to us the horror of how they feel? And the only way we came up with was, was getting people to do self-portraits. And I've got a couple of these here to show you. So this is one actually I downloaded once from uh, an old BDD website called BDD Central. But, and I know the person who drew this uh, of herself is nothing, of course, looking like this, but it conveys to you the horror of how she feels that she looks. Um, and I always feel that 
you know, this, this also conveys the problem, often the people have multiple perceived defects, um, and although someone could describe to you some of the ways they feel they look, in their words, a, a, a picture tells a thousand words, because it can really convey to you how you think you look much better, in a, in the more the horror of it. And this gentleman felt uh, a physical sensation on the top of his head, so he didn't have a visual image as such. Um, it was a, sen a very physical felt sensation of how he feels at the top of his head, and that's how he felt, therefore, he looked um, in the mirror. Uh, this young woman was uh, raped in about 10 years prior to presentation, and after the rape, she looked in the mirror, and not surprisingly, she saw, this is what she saw in the mirror, but it's almost as if it burnt on her mind's eye. She didn't have trauma symptoms, but she now had BDD um, some 10 years later still. Um, this is a, a gentleman who, uh, as you can see on the left, had felt he had a very large nose, um, and that's what he wanted to have a nose job on. But you can see that after treatment, uh, which was things like uh, cognitive behaviour therapy and I think medication, you can see that the size of his nose has uh, drastically reduced. And uh, that's a very good indication of a successful treatment. And that's why we call this a psychorhinoplasty, uh, because it's a purely you know, psychological, psychiatric treatment. is nothing to do with uh, what surgeons do in terms of rhinoplasty. And it's great fun sometimes at uh, cosmetic surgeon conferences sometimes to speak, where uh, actually all they do is show you their before and after pictures of their handiwork that they've done of their patients. And um, that's all they're interested in, really, in, the, in their skills of before and after. And I can go along sometimes and sort of show them my, <laughs> my treatments as well. So obviously the person's Appearance has not changed, but their body image has changed. That's why, you know, this is a body image problem, because the body image will change. And, as you know, surgeons tend to love to go on and on about uh, facial transplant surgery and so on. But we did this years ago. And you can see here, the lady on the left uh, felt that she was from outer space almost, that she didn't have a nose or a mouth. And uh, after successful psychological treatments, you can see she gets her nose and mouth back again. So, you know, that's where a very dramatic change in terms of body image has occurred. Uh, one more where you can see the way that this lady um, has got a very uh, multiple preoccupations um, in terms of the way she felt she looked. But after treatment, you can see she's very different. You know? So the point being is that this is a body image problem, that the appearance has not changed, the way you feel about it and that felt impression has changed. And uh, one more, you can see that this lady felt that she had a very big uh, enlarged jaw and uh, a very sort of head, and you can see again after treatment that um, the jaw is reduced in size. It looks like there's a side effect there of therapy. It looks as if a breast size has reduced. Uh, we, we have to keep quiet about that one. It's an unfortunate side effect. Um, so, uh, the point I'm trying to make is, this is a body image problem. It's quite difficult to really get into the mind of an individual with BDD and really understand what it is that they're experiencing. And, and the best way we've known so far doing this is by self-portraits. And so what's happening is that we think that when you're having this uh, body image problem, we then have a problem of fusion. That's what I mean by uh, a process whereby your current experience of your thoughts and images are viewed as the truth. Are they, yeah? So, um, in other words, the, the aim in therapy is therefore to be able to diffuse or be able to distance yourself from the thought and image. And that's very tricky. That is very difficult to be able to stand back and be able to see it, to view it, but not be it. Yes, it's a, once you are being it, you're fused with it and you see it as the absolute truth and a fact, as opposed to just standing back and seeing it for what it is. Very tough, very tough. And we're saying that uh, those features that are distorted tend to then define yourself. And that's why we saw, you saw that picture of the self as walking nose. And I remember a patient telling me, you know, that I am just my nose. That's all that I am. 
So what seems to be happening is that the individuals of BDD have these idealized values about the importance of appearance and really defining the self. Um, and so the aim in therapy here is to help people to view their self as more complex than more than one feature of one's appearance. In other words, they're made up of many, many different bits to themselves, not just their appearance. Again, that is really tough. It's very difficult. The next thing that happens in, in this is what we call self-focused attention. Now, yes. Um, <laughs> I saw this actually at Chelsea Flower Show. And I thought, well, I'm not going to have that in my garden. But <laughs> this is what I call self-focused attention. In other words, you are really getting all the information about the world from all the shit up in your head, as it were. Yeah? You're, this is extreme self-focused attention on, on that imagery and all the emotions and so on. So it's a little like having a portable internal mirror. You don't really need mirrors because it's all in your head. Yeah? So this causes the extreme self-consciousness. And when people are very convinced about how they look, then it's almost like you're permanently self-focused. When perhaps there's some ability to switch attention between being very self-focused and externally focused, then there may be more doubts about how you look and when looking in the mirror. And obviously, therefore, throughout therapy, the aim in, is to help people focus externally, to get information from the outer world in terms of what's going on around you, rather than how you feel and how, what you think you look like, and so on and so on. So terribly important. I mean, this is some of these concepts, of course, are not just uh, exclusive to BDD. It's, it carries across different types of emotional problems as well. And being self-focused is uh, terribly dangerous and uh, very uh, important to get out of your head. And then, of course, the beliefs, or what we call the evaluations and expectations, are your rating yourself. Not surprising if you saw those particular body images uh, as very ugly and defective. And your expectations are likely to be that you're going to be rejected or humiliated. And as you heard from um, uh, Paul Gilbert this morning, these are absolutely crucial to be able to be um, uh, in terms of the fears that people have in terms of being abandoned and wanting to be able to attract others, be able to be connecting with others. There's some evidence that people with BDD may have sort of partly lost their rose-tinted glasses. In other words, if you don't have BDD, then you tend to sort of rate yourself as actually more attractive than you actually are. Yeah? <laughs> so that people with BDD tend to uh, have slightly lost those rose-tinted glasses, whereas healthy people are a little bit more over-optimistic. You know? <laughs> so, but the key thing here is to help people test out their expectations and so on, absolutely crucial, and to give up rating, judging, comparing, very toxic. And you also heard today about the importance of shame. And we separate out internal shame is where you are judging and rating yourself and all the disgust is directed at yourself and the emotion of external shame where you are making predictions about how other people are judging and rating you and the feeling anxious about being rejected. Um, there's also quite a few people often have this sensation of feeling not just right. There's a sort of sense of tension. So it may not be uh, panicky as such, but it's just not right. And that very much overlaps sometimes with people with OCD as well. There may be depression at various losses in your life and missed opportunities and anger at surgeons or family or other people who just don't understand. So you can see there's a whole... Um, a cauldron of different emotions at different times as well. And so what we have is a vicious cycle of uh, a bit like a panic attack, but here in the BDD we've got seeing yourself as very ugly and different and alone, those are the most common themes, uh, the emotions of shame, disgust and anxiety, and that image of yourself in terms of how you feel you look. And it goes around in this vicious circle. And what we would, in psychological theory, call these is what's called emotional conditioning. In other words, they're very likely, uh, these things have become conditioned with one another and um, very likely to have been associated with difficult experiences in your childhood or, or, or adolescence. 
it's a bit like um, uh, you've been bitten by a dog as a child and um, you don't, as now as an adult, and you're in the park and the dog is wagging its tail and wanting to play ball with you, but you're still feeling panicky. Yeah? So there's what Paul Gilbert called the old brain is telling you there's a threat, even though your new brain is telling you that this is perfectly safe. So there are often, but not everybody, have ghosts from the past. And uh, the most common narrative is of bullying, teasing, abuse, often then becoming associated with body image, but not necessarily. It's not, uh, in psychiatric terms, post-traumatic stress disorder, but these images often have a sense of nowness and have not been uh, emotionally processed. And as I said, not everybody with BDD have images with powerful, aversive experiences in the past, but it's a common narrative. And so often what's happening is that people with, with BDD do certainly have a sense of feeling being different during uh, adolescence and childhood. Um, that's, for example, they've been teased or bullied about being different, but the memories of some of those experiences have persisted. It still feels as if they're happening now. And it could be perhaps some variation of normal appearance. Let's say you've got red hair. Uh, it could be a lower status or less valued in normal appearance. For example, you're a size smaller height or breast size or you use glasses. Or it could, uh, it could be a condition that's since been surgically corrected. Like, for example, you've got bat ears, but that's now normal. Um, or it could be a condition that's improved since adolescence, so it's become hardly noticeable when people have been teased, for example, of having pizza face for acne. Or it could be being different generally. You might be homosexual, you might be from a different race or culture, or have a specific learning disability like dyslexia. All these things, uh, unfortunately, adolescents do target, and they hunt like packs and tease and bully. You know, adolescents can be bastards. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> but of course, these things have become internalized and or it could be internalized by observation of seeing other people teased or bullied about these things and it feels as if it's still happening now yeah that's the the main model as it were and one of the things that rob was doing for his phd was actually looking at well can we try to update those memories and uh, we did select out uh, particular cases who had a very uh, strong uh, images that were linked to those adversive experiences. And we used something called imagery scripting to try to update those memories. And he found that um, about two thirds of people did well with this particular intervention. And um, that was uh, written up and we're still writing up some of the other ones. But um, we think that's an important now component or module for people with BDD in terms of trying to treat this with CBT. Um, and uh, we don't yet know who it still best works for, but when it works, it can work quite well. So having got that vicious circle and that very distorted imagery and so on, it's not surprising that you're going to respond to it in various ways, in terms of various ways of coping. And the type of psychology here is what we call operant conditioning, or being shaped, because these things are very reinforcing. For example, ruminating is, um, what we do know is that when you ruminate, it works, because it suppresses the imagery, it suppresses emotion whilst you ruminate, but then when you stop ruminating, the unintended consequences are is you get a rebound, you get more depressed, you get more shameful, and so on. So you can see here that most of the stuff that goes on in your head is ruminating or comparing or attacking yourself, something <coughs> that Paul talked to us this morning a lot about. And of course, all these things um, may have particular motivations, they seem to work in the short term, <coughs> But of course, they have lots of unintended consequences in the long term. And again, if, you, if you're somebody here who doesn't have BDD, just try it out for yourself, because you can find that you can make yourself very disturbed quite quickly by ruminating, comparing, and attacking yourself. It, it'll absolutely drive you around the bend. Um, so in therapy, what we obviously aim to do is to try to increase awareness of when somebody is ruminating. 
and choosing an alternative that's incompatible with ruminating. And that often involves activity, getting out of your head and doing stuff. And um, obviously one of the things that we do need to try and understand more about is um, the motivations behind uh, ruminating and comparing. And I'll talk about that in a minute. The other things that people do are to um, respond by what, all these what we call repetitive behaviours or safety-seeking behaviours. And again, each time you uh, use something to, to camouflage for something, it feels safe. Nothing bad happened. And so therefore it's very reinforced. Um, quite a few of these safety behaviours, particularly things like checking and mirrors, is to verify, to see exactly how you look, to check to, and, and have the hope perhaps that you don't look as bad as you think you look. And of course sometimes that works and so, of course, it's reinforced. You're more likely to check again. But then again, you become more self-focused, and you get all the uh, rubbish in, in your head taking over, and it feels again how awful that you look at it. Sometimes, of course, you're trying to undo things. Again, very similar to OCD, if you're doing, say, a hand washing um, or something, it's very much like that in terms of undoing it, getting it back to how it used to be or improving it. And that's the whole thing around uh, cosmetic procedures. So obviously in uh, therapy we want to try and test those out um, to uh, what is the effect of dropping those safety behaviours and repetitive behaviours and whether the solutions are in fact the problems because of course all these safety seeking behaviours tend to make you feel worse. I've, I've tried this for myself, I actually looked in the mirror for half an hour, I put the Wagner on in the background to make me more depressed. I. Um, <laughs> really honed in on those bits of me that are less attractive. I really attacked myself and became very self-focused. It was ghastly, ghastly, ghastly. I couldn't bear it. But this, of course, is what someone with BDD is doing all the time and has all the unintended consequences of feeling worse. You know, the solutions are the problem. Um, but the problem is, of course, it is very reinforcing because in the short term, it may feel that you're more in control. It may feel as if you're getting a little bit more certainty about how exactly you look and, and so on. So it is reinforcing in the short term, but of course it has all these unintended consequences of making you more preoccupied, more distressed. And it's, it's really important sometimes to really understand some of these, uh, the motivation behind the ruminating and the safety behaviours and so on. So here are some typical ones that, that Rob picked up in, in his PhD. So look at some of these, you know, if I can work out why I look so ugly, then maybe I can fix it. Yes, so it's often motivated by problem solving, trying to, to, to fix something, but of course it never does fix it. Um, I attack myself so it stops me from deluding myself that I look okay. You know, ugly, 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 and that will stop me from deluding myself. And it also maintains the BDD and actually makes you feel a lot worse. Um, it mentally prepares me for being humiliated. So if I can uh, attack myself and really remind myself how ugly I am, it will uh, soften me up a little bit and mentally prepare myself for when someone does come along and really attack me. It makes sort of sense, but unfortunately, it's another example of where the solutions are the problem. Uh, if I plan what I can do to fix it, it gives me hope and it stops me from committing suicide. You know, that's a tricky one because we don't want to take away the hope, but you can see that it's, it's a, down a rabbit hole and you're not going to get anywhere. If I don't compare, I won't know where I stand. So this is back to this sort of social ranking that you must know where you are so that you can be uh, submissive and make sure, therefore, that you're not going to be rejected or humiliated. So these are the sorts of um, beliefs and motivations that it's important to really tease out in therapy and try to think about whether in fact these are really truly acting in your values and in your best interests because they are obviously incompatible with your goals and in, in any therapy. And of course another big thing in BDD that maintains it is the avoidance behaviour and there are all sorts of Avoidances, which may be specific to BDD, let's say having a going to the hairdresser or going to a swimming pool, things like that. Or it could be um, 
more general in terms of being housebound and not taking more sort of social anxiety and problems. But of course, in therapy, the key thing is to be able to do the exposure, to do the experiments, to test out your expectations and what it is that you're predicting. And so um, those are the key issues, we think, in self and aesthetic object and the way you cope and respond that we think keep the problem going and help us guide therapy. Um, and you can you know, monitor the therapy processes as well. So we've developed a scale called the Appearance Anxiety Inventory, and you could use this even you know, if you're taking medication for this trial or if you're doing any type of therapy or intervention. Um, what we do know is that these are, it's a freely available scale, it's sensitive to change, and we know that as people improve, then the frequency of these particular processes will decrease. So there will be less comparing, less checking, less avoidance, uh, less ruminating, less brooding, less um, analysing, less being self-focused, less uh, avoiding mir um, mirrors sometimes, less seeing, uh, seeking reassurance, discussing your appearance, less of camouflaging and less trying to prevent people from seeing different bits to you. So as you improve, those things will gradually improve. And we demonstrated that um, in uh, the first trial that compared CBT against anxiety management. In other words, we did have to, in order to prove to the world that there was something specific going on, that it wasn't just seeing a therapist and the passage of time and everything else, that there did seem to be something that was specific. So we did this um, in a small controlled trial, and we were able to demonstrate that uh, over, over 12 weeks that there was something specific going on, and it wasn't just uh, seeing a therapist or uh, doing homework and having a good relationship with a therapist, that there was something going on. And my colleagues also at uh, the Maudsley, which we collaborated with, had also done the similar trial, but just against a wait list, um, again, the CBT against four adolescents. And that was also able, very similar results in terms of the, the effect size. So there are nice guidelines, and that's a very important document for you to use if you are having trouble in accessing the right treatment. Um, and it's very similar, therefore, the advice for uh, BDD, similar to OCD, that is, if you've got mild function impairment, you should be offered brief CBT. If you've got moderate function impairment, you should be offered a choice of CBT or a medication. And if you've got severe function impairment, you should be offered a combination of the two. And if that doesn't work, you should be offered a combination of the two um, or a different med type of medication. You should be perhaps now being stepped up to a more multidisciplinary team with expertise in OCD, BDD. Um, and then what's happening is the CBT is becoming perhaps more intense in terms of more frequent or more experienced therapists. You may have other different types of medication. And at the very top of the range, um, those with severe or chronic problems should have continuing access to um, specialist teams in BDD. And there are also inpatient and residential services where people come and stay uh, for up to 12 weeks or so, and uh, where you're, you're getting more frequent CBT. So there is a clear plan for most people. You can read about it more in a self-help book on the right, uh, The Overcoming Body Image Problems, and that's a treatment manual as well for therapists. What's my um, bucket list of things I've got to do before I die? Uh, we're still early days in research and development in BDD. We do want to try and develop and evaluate new modules like Paul's compassion focused therapy in terms of how, what can this add, particularly in those people who are ruminating and are very self-attacking. Can we try and develop alternatives to the ruminating and the comparing in, in some of the things that uh, Rob identified in terms of the motivations. It would be nice to do a big trial of CBT and uh, medication against CBT in a placebo, but these sort of things are very difficult to do and very difficult to get funding for. I mean, the, the NHS do fund big trials, but you know, uh, this sort of thing will cost you about 750,000 or something, because there are so many costs in doing these sorts of trials properly. The other thing we'd like to look at is in people having rhinoplasty because rhinoplasty seems to be the most problematic cosmetic intervention. And um, you know, what exactly is it that predicts 
poor outcome in terms of BDD or other factors in people having rhinoplasty because it's a, it's a very tricky procedure. We obviously want to disseminate good practice around the world as such and prevention, particularly in schools, um, in terms of how can we prevent BDD more happening. I'm going to stop there. One quick question. A 70, okay, you've got a 17 year old. Well, never give up. That's the first phrase. Because, you know, sometimes, been necessarily, some people aren't ready at one stage. They may be ready later on in terms of doing the work that's necessary. Second thing is that um, I agree with you that when you're turning 18, all hell lets loose in terms of services because things do change from being adolescent into adult services and things do get more difficult and tricky but you can get stepped up it may be now more appropriate to be in say for example a residential unit to get more intensive therapy or so on so it's obviously difficult for me to comment on an individual case but but don't give up 